All right, uh, the sovereignty of God. God is the creator, the master, the ruler of the universe and everything and everyone in it. Okay, whether you like it or not, God's the boss. Okay, period. There's a whole lot of people in the world that don't like it. It doesn't matter. Okay, God is the boss. Um, there is no being, whether angel, demon, or human, with any power in and of himself. All power is from God and subject to his control. Okay, that is what I believe is the definition of sovereignty. The Calvinist changes that somewhat, in fact, considerably. Um, John Gill, an Englishman, he was a Baptist, he was a Calvinist. There's quite a few Calvinistic Baptists in England. Uh, Charles Spurgeon was a Calvinist. The current pastor of Spurgeon's church is a Calvinist. He's a good man, but he's a Calvinist. Um, Spurgeon was not nearly as extreme in his Calvinism as some. But John Gill, who was one of Spurgeon's predecessors in Spurgeon's church, uh, said this, Whatever is done in time is according to God's decree in eternity. Whatever happens, and when they say whatever, they mean whatever. Okay? Whatever happens is according to God's decree in eternity. A fellow named Lorraine Bettner, um, who is a very famous Calvinist theologian, says, Even the fall of Adam, and through him the fall of the race, was not by chance or accident, but was so ordained in the secret counsels of God. Now the phrase, the secret counsels of God, I think they use that whenever they can't find a verse for it. <laughs> okay, it's a secret. Uh, <laughs> if it's a secret, I wonder how they know it. Okay, but somehow or other they know things that God has kept secret from us. Uh, <laughs> um, Arthur Pink who is, again, is a very famous Calvinist. He has written some books that, I mean, he's got a book on Genesis that's about that big, okay? And it would have a lot of good stuff in it, okay? Some of these Calvinists have some good stuff if they can just stay away from Calvinism, okay? Um, let me say this, okay? And I would have to go back to the last message. Why am I talking about this? Because it is a dangerous thing that is happening in the church in America today. And guess what, beloved? America is still providing the money for missions around this world. And if America starts sending out more and more and more Calvinists to the mission field, or bringing preachers from other countries and educating them in Calvinist institutions, then Calvinism is just going to spread like wildfire throughout the world. And there's going to be very little soul winning done. And that's a terrible, terrible shame. Um, let me read some names that you may recognize. John MacArthur. John Piper. Uh, R.C. Spruill, who just recently died. Um, James White. Albert Moeller. He's the president of Southern Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, which is considered the flagship Southern Baptist Seminary. Um, these men are Calvinists. They may be good men. Okay, I'm not attacking their morals, their integrity, their financial upstandingness, or anything like that. I'm not trying to say there's any kind of scandal or anything attached to any of these men. But their doctrines are bad. Okay, their doctrines are bad. Every one of these men is a Calvinist. Some of them you can hear on the radio just about any day of the week, on television and so on. They have written multitude of books and so on. They are extremely influential men and they teach and preach Calvinism. Okay? Um, all right, we've got to move here. Um, so Arthur Pink, 
says, It was God's will that sin should enter the world. For nothing happens save as God has eternally decreed. He went on to say, Not only did His omniscient eye see Adam eating of the forbidden fruit, but He decreed beforehand that He should do so. God in eternity past, before there was a world, before Adam was created, God decreed that Adam would eat the forbidden fruit. Now, I want you to think about this. God commanded Adam not to eat of the fruit. Right? He said, you can eat them all, but that one over there, and you're not supposed to eat that one. Right? He commanded Adam not to eat the fruit. Adam disobeyed. And by disobeying, he performed God's will. You say, wait a minute, God's will was don't eat it. I mean, isn't that what it sounds like to you? If you just read Genesis, what do you come up with? God didn't want them to eat the fruit, right? Well, if, if that's what God said don't do, then His will must have been not to do it. Doesn't that make sense? Sounds to me like it makes sense. So, Adam fulfilled God's will by disobeying. And because of his, because of doing his will, God's will, God placed Adam and Eve and all their descendants under the curse. Adam disobeyed, but by disobeying, he did what God wanted him to do in the first place, and what God made him do, because he sovereignly decreed that he would do it. But then he punished him. And you and me. Okay? And the 7 billion people in the world, probably about 90% or 95% of whom are headed straight for hell because it's the will of God. And that's what they say is sovereignty. 1 Chronicles 29, verses 11 and 12. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and in the earth is Thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and Thou art exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come of Thee, and Thou reignest over all. And in Thine hand is power and might. And notice this next part. And in Thine hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. God is the Sovereign but He can give strength to others. Okay? He can give, he can, it's in His hand to make others great. Alright? Now we're going to get to that thought a little bit more in just a minute. God's will, according to the Calvinist, cannot be thwarted or resisted by anyone to any degree. God is therefore the cause of everything that happens, including sin and evil. Okay, now think about your own life. You are confronted with a decision of some sort. Okay? Let me get particular. You gentlemen, you're at home, the TV's on. You've just been watching a football game or whatever, okay? You've been watching something, there's nothing wrong. It's over, the next show comes on, and it's got some things on it that you look at and you say, hmm, oh, that's not good. Okay? The way that woman is dressed and that kind of stuff, I probably shouldn't watch this. You've now got a decision to make, okay? Do I change channels, turn it off, or do I sit here and watch? You've got a decision to make. Sometimes you make the right decision, and maybe sometimes some of you make the wrong decision. And you're sitting there doing something that you know God doesn't want you to do. The Holy Spirit who lives within you has said, you know, you ought to turn that off. 
You didn't hear a voice, but you know he told you, right? If you disobey the leading of the Holy Spirit and what you know is the standards contained in the Bible, according to the Calvinist, you're fulfilling God's will because everything that happens was preordained by God. Now, beloved, that is absolute nonsense. Okay, I mean, I hate to say it, but that is bunk. Okay, that's baloney. As we say down south, that's hogwash. Okay, my goodness. Didn't we just read His holiness, His glory, His majesty? I don't get it. I mean, it was... We were talking to, I was talking to Howard in between, and pick up the Bible, open to Genesis chapter 1, and start reading. Read the whole thing. There's a few verses, a very few, but a few verses that are going to give you a little bit of trouble. But you won't find Calvinism anywhere in it. Okay? It's not there. Now, you can go to seminary and find Calvinism. You can pick up the wrong books and find Calvinism. You can turn on the radio and find Calvinism, but you can't find it in the Bible. Okay? Read it, and you won't be a Calvinist. All right. Um, okay, some problems with their idea of Calvinism. First of all, what I just said, the Bible doesn't say that. This nonsense about God foreordained everything and everything that happens was God's will. Okay? You can't blame your sin on God. I'm sorry. But you can't. It's your fault. And that's it. Okay? The Bible doesn't say it. Give me a chapter and verse that, that gives this definition of sovereignty and you can't find it. God is absolutely holy and cannot cause men to sin. And I've got several verses. Let me just read one of them for time's sake. James chapter 1 verse 13, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Okay? Your sin is your doing and not God's. God cannot be tempted with evil. He cannot do wrong. Okay? Um, my son likes to use this thing, an evangelistic tool at public parks and things. Um, three things God cannot do, and there's three doors. And the first one, and everybody said, and you ask somebody, can God do everything? Well, of course He can. Well, no, there's some things God cannot do. Let's take a look. Open the first door. God cannot lie. Titus 1, 2. Okay? And they say, oh, there's a bunch of things God cannot do. He's got the power to do anything, but His nature will not allow Him to be unholy, to be dishonest, okay? And, and a number of other things. He cannot go contrary to His own nature. All right, so God is absolutely holy. He cannot cause men to sin. Uh, another verse on that. Talking about Jesus, Hebrews 7.26. For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. Our Savior is absolutely holy. Mm -hmm.